Right now, I'm picturing uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street right now. Yeah. Coked out of his mind. Yeah, that was me. And he was a healthy, vibrant, beautiful five-year-old boy who laid at the bottom of that pool for about 12 minutes. And he fell into the pool. How old was he? About five years old. And he was a healthy, vibrant, beautiful five-year-old boy who laid at the bottom of that pool for about 12 minutes and was brought back up and given mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and regained consciousness. Wow. But has extensive catastrophic brain, brain damage. damage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wish the world were a place where, you know, the corporation would say, hey, sorry, we f***ed up. Uh, we want to make this right. Um, what's it going to cost? Um, you know, but that's not the way it works. Because... Um, corporations and people of means want to put the responsibility on somebody else. They want to want to run away from it. Mm. Um, but in that case, as a young attorney, I assembled a group of people. This is never uh, a me thing. I mean, I needed uh, neuropsychologists and, and um, pediatric neurosurgeons, and I needed um, you know experts to talk about um, property, proper property, property management. And as a young attorney, I assembled this team of experts um, and presented a case such that um, they had to fess up, they had to take responsibility. Um, and I was able to secure a settlement for that young man that would pay him over $28 million over the course of his lifetime and provide him with the one-on-one -on -one care he needs for the rest of his life. That's incredible. And yeah, that is a good feeling to know that I was able to help him. Um, and you know, most of my catastrophically injured clients, and they're not all catastrophically injured, but most of my, all of my catastrophically injured clients would gladly give up all of the millions I'm able to secure for them yeah. in exchange for taking time back and not having to deal with whatever it is they're dealing with. You know, um, I'm even happier that we actually have you on set today because I think when folks, at least me, when I think when the general public thinks about personal injury attorneys, you have this image that uh, has kind of been molded in your mind, uh, you know, partially helped to be, you know, helped by Hollywood and how they frame, you know, uh, personal injury attorneys that ambulance chasers, as I, you know, jokingly said earlier, but you really don't hear that side, I guess, unless you're speaking to an attorney about how important that work is to, to truly make people whole after they've been wronged. And that's, that's, that's really, 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 really incredible. Yeah, and I mean, I could go on and on and on with stories of people who are catastrophically injured um, and are trying desperately to put their life back together again. Yeah. Um, and they deserve to be compensated. You know, this is not a lottery. My clients aren't like, oh, I got this, you know, bundle. This, this windfall, yeah. Yeah, this windfall from uh, the sky. Um, they're broken people who mm. need to, you know, be made whole to the best of our ability, have the right care for the rest of their life, the right appliances for the rest of their life, the right surgeries, the, be the best surgeons. I mean, um, the, these folks didn't ask for this to happen. Hmm. Um, and at some point in the last, I guess, eight or nine years, I also pivoted toward an area of the law called a mass tort. Okay. I don't know um, what people think that means, but it's not a class action case but I represent a group of individuals who were injured by a similar product. Okay. Um, so, you know, seven or eight years ago, Johnson & Johnson had a product 
um, that they marketed to middle-aged women who have had children who begin to have something called organ prolapse, where their organs in their body begin to drop down um, as a result of the childbirthing experience. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not unusual for those women to um, have urinary incontinence um, as a result of the organ prolapse. And they marketed this mesh um, that really should have been used for a sterile site, but they marketed it to be used in the vagina um, to prop the organs up. And this product um, in a non-sterile site was a devastating injury to these women because mm. it created massive infection. It, the product began to break up and migrate to other parts of their body and attach itself to other organs. Wow. And once it became enmeshed in the tissue, it was impossible to yeah, get it out. Yeah. And forget about a sex life after that because the, their husbands were actually feeling the mesh inside. It was a devastating injury. And the, the company did nothing to warn their, the people who were about to have this installed what the consequences were. So yes, we represented hundreds and hundreds of women in that litigation um, and about 10 of those cases, maybe more, went to trial. And um, one of my clients in that litigation received an $80 million verdict. Hmm. Um, but she had more than 11 surgeries pulling the tissue and the mesh out of her body. Um, chemical ablations where they burned the tissue in order to stop it from migrating any further. I mean, it was horrific. Um, again, my clients, any one of my seriously injured clients wow. would gladly give up all, all the money, the money yeah. for a healthy life. My goodness. That's, that's wild. You do important work. And for those that are watching today and they want to do that important work with you, what are three points that you would give to the attorneys that are coming behind you into this field for them to have a similar level of success that you've achieved in your life? Have confidence in yourself. Okay. Learn from others who are the best at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, don't worry about making the money now. Um, Speaking about the money, um, what percentage typically does a law firm, you know, similar to yours, take, uh, not take, but what do they earn? Usually it's 40%. Okay. It, that's negotiable line item, but it's not unusual to charge 40%. Um, right now I'm in the midst of a um, mass tort that involves hair relaxer for actually primarily African-American women who use this chemical to straighten their hair. Um, what they weren't told by the companies who manufactured it is that it causes a doubled increase in uterine and endometrial cancers and fibroids. And the fibroids lead to hysterectomies. And if you go into a hysterectomy clinic, you'll be surrounded by black women. And they look at each other and wonder why. Because they were using that hair relaxer product for years and years. And it exposed them, opened, them their horm opened their hormonal system up to being more susceptible to a cancer because of that product. No warnings, nothing. And so we're bringing claims against all the big manufacturers who have profited by billions of dollars on the backs of these black women who are now suffering the consequences of their, their actions. Hmm. How do you get your clients to see? I can tell that you care about your clients beyond the money. Obviously, you have the financial component. You're running a business at the end of the day, but it's very clear that you, you absolutely care very, very much about your clients, about the work you do. Look for somebody who's authentic. You know, when you're talking and interviewing a lawyer, yeah. 
if your feeling is that he's not listening to you, he's not really caring about you, then get your ass up and move to somebody else. Mm. You know, <coughs> I, I acquire clients wherever I am. I try to stay away from lawyers. <laughs> they don't really help too much in, in you know, building my business. Right. But, you know, if I was in a bowling league, okay, or a dart league, um, or any other kind of regular activity, um, you know, s hanging around guys who love cars, there's all kinds of things that you're out there talking and interacting and hanging out with the general public and everybody, you know, I don't hide what I do. Um, people see it and they're attracted to it because they do see, I think, that I am authentic, that I'm real, that I care. Um, so that's the last bit of advice I would give to somebody who is coming up behind me is, you know, this is a business for people who really care about other people. Huh. Um, and um, if you don't have that, if that's not a part of who you are, maybe you should be working for a corporate law firm. Huh. You know, making an hourly, uh, an hourly uh, salary. See how the wow. headrest is now coming towards the back of your head. Yep, I see it. Beautiful. What? This is a specimen. And, and then here's your massage uh, button. Nice. This is the car I need in my life. Uh, and sometimes, I actually, I, uh, if I don't want, like, if I'm going into the sit into New York, yeah, um, I, I will have a driver drive me, and I'll just stay in the back. Yeah. Well, and the, if uh, you see this, yeah, love it. This nice. this controls everything from the rear seat, climate control, music, um, all everything that. Every um, passenger comfort can be controlled from, from this little pad. I really thought I was done with sedans, I'm telling you. How many attorneys uh, are with your firm? Seven. How expensive is it to run a firm of that, uh, of that size? Um, it, it's expensive, right. I mean. The reason I ask is because we try to paint a picture, not because I want you to open the books to your financials, but. Well, uh, we I just as an example of what 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 it looks like at your level for the folks that are that are that are coming up behind there. Yeah, as an example, I have uh, two offices, but the Center City office is our flagship. Okay. Um, I spend uh, my rent just for the office is about thirty five thousand a month. Mm. There's salaries, there's insurances, um, and then there's a lot of money that I spend in preparing my case for trial that I don't get back if I lose that case. Yeah. Um, tens of thousands of dollars for every case that eventually goes or gets close to going to trial. Hmm. Um, and that money is only recouped if we're successful on your behalf. What's the largest settlement your firm's ever negotiated? Um, we participated in the transvaginal mesh settlement. That one you just mentioned, got it. But a lot of those settlements, um, I'm not really, uh, part of the settlement is confidentiality. Understood. And so <clears throat> we're not able to, um, to really disclose, those disclose the, uh, the, the final figures. Um, but you know, it's, uh, that was a seven year project from beginning to end. My yeah. fee on that project was probably about 14 or $15 million. Hmm. It sounds like a, it sounds lucrative. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, you right, know. if we could switch gears again for two seconds, um, it was tough just trying to figure out what car to get you to bring. Um, we both love cars. Yes. By the way, when did, the, uh, when did that appreciation for automobiles start? When I was um, a kid. Childhood. Yeah, yeah. childhood. Yep, same. Same. I tell people all the time I used to park my Hot Wheels along the, the wall and, you know, this is, you get to play with it as a grown-up. So we were struggling trying to figure out 
what you'd bring because in your collection, I'll let you tell it. What do you have right now um, in your in your current car collection? Right now, I have um, a Porsche GT2 RS, which is the the granddaddy of all 911 Porsches. It's yep. a twin turbocharged monster, 730 horsepower. Um, that they squeeze out of a six-cylinder engine. Which is insane to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's just so much fun to drive. In addition, what I have... What are they retailing for now? Four or five hundred thousand? Um, sometimes higher than that. Six, yeah. You know, it, it, during the pandemic, um, yeah. it, they were going for over 600. Yeah. Uh, I think they've slid down a little bit at this point, but that's a car that I'm confident because it's the last petrol engine GT2 RS that will ever be made. And mine is a 2019. They made a 2018 because of some problems in supply chain. They didn't expect to, but they pushed it to 2019 with very few units actually being codified as a 2019. And I have one of them. Mm. Um, that car will, that's an asset that will increase in value over my lifetime. Yeah, so that's, it's fair to say that that's, that's a piece that you're either going to have in your collection for a very long time or probably for life. Yeah, uh, let my kids worry about dealing with that after I'm gone. Gotcha. And then I have a Porsche GT4 RS. Yeah, um, we took a ride is, in that one, yeah. Which is a Cayman body style, not a 911, um, that, you know, they didn't ever want the Cayman to compete with the 911, mm -hmm. um, but they finally relented with the GT4 RS, which is the last iteration of that car's petrol engine. That will be a hybrid or all electric vehicle in its next go round. And um, they took a GT3 RS engine and shoehorned that into the, GT, into the Cayman body. And it's a mid-engine, not a rear engine, and they had to turn the engine sideways in order to fit it, it in. Fit, wow. Yeah, it's a cool, cool car, and yeah. I, 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 hopefully one day your your viewers will get a chance to see that because that's never leaving the collection. Well, I think there's there's no doubt, um, you know, even as we're filming this now, that this is a highly interesting interview, and I know, you know <laughs> we're just scratching the surface, so we'll definitely have you back. But those are two cars in addition to this that you named. What else do you have? Mercedes-Benz, every seven or eight years, makes a black series vehicle. Yeah. Um, and they choose one model to just put all the bells and whistles uh, from performance-wise into the car and to turn it into something that nobody ever would expect. And, and in, in um, 2021, the uh, black series vehicle that they chose was the GT. Um, and they took the, uh, the GT and transformed it into a monster that is actually, I believe, um, my GT2 RS was the fastest around the Nürburgring, and then the Black Series became the best in the GT2 RS by like, you know, a hundredth of a second or a tenth of a second. Um, so the GT2 RS and the and the Black Series AMG GT uh, are the fastest around the Nürburgring for production cars. Yeah. Um, and so I have that. Mm -hmm. Mercedes G-Wagon. Beautiful, 63, obviously. Yes. Yeah, okay, awesome. Where do you go from here? What are you gonna add to the collection? Or actually, I'll ask you this. Um, we like to ask our guests, what are their top three uh, cars, if you could own anything right now, um, what would those be? Mine constantly changes, but. Yeah, so does mine. A Bugatti. Okay, which one? The Santa Dice. It's like the 100th anniversary Bugatti. Okay. It, they're going for somewhere between seven and nine million. Yeah. I've driven a Bugatti, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm happy just to have done that. There, I can't even explain to you the sound of 1,500 horsepower spooling up in a turbocharger, and when it opens up finally, it's like, I guess, being a Top Gun pilot in a... I was it, just thinking, that's probably the only thing that my mind can really 
yep. latch on to, to to compare it to? Um, okay, so that's number one. We got two more slots. Um, it's a tough question, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Mercedes Project One. Beautiful car. Beautiful. I just saw a clip on Instagram. Um, I don't know what track they were on. Probably some place in Europe. And uh, somebody bought out uh, some crazy Bugatti. It might have been the one you just uh, you just mentioned. And the, the the heading of the clip was like, when you just when you think you know, this was the craziest car in set, and then a Project One uh, came out, and it was just gorgeous. Yeah, fabulous. Car. Yeah, beautiful. Um, one of my, you know, I, I I don't feel bad because I just I I didn't have it like that then, but when. Porsche came out with the 918 Spider. Um, I could have bought one for list price, eight or nine hundred thousand. Yeah, <clears throat> it just wasn't possible. I didn't, you know, that wasn't where I was at that point. Yeah, um, and they're going for 1.8 to 2, two million. million. Yep. Um, what a, a beautiful car. Yeah. There's a gentleman um, in the area. You know, we'll have him on. Uh, he committed to come on in the fall. We'll see how serious he is, but. Um, He's got a, a, a 918, and it is... It's all that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so th those are probably three cars that um, at some point I'll probably own. I really love Aston Martin, um, my favorite marquee. That being said, I think I like, I just like English yeah. cars. I think they just do it right, whether you're talking about Rolls-Royce, Aston, Land Rover, McLaren, uh, and now this Bentley, I mean, it's just, from a stylistic standpoint, right? So we're sitting back here, you take a look at that carbon fiber trim and how it wraps around mm -hmm. the driver and the passenger. And then even how the stitching, it's, it's still going. There's no carbon fiber trim back here, but the stitching itself is still going completely in line with that. I mean, they have, who even thinks about yeah, that? Yeah, they have an amazing attention to detail. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and then they have this raised leather panels with, you know, in yeah. the door. Yeah, so I noticed that up front. That, you know, you can see, I guess, when I hit the light on there, but all of this together, it's just, it is incredible. Beautiful. Now, you're working on an addition to the garage right now, right? <clears throat> I guess, um, uh, you know, or store them down at the shore house. Oh, no, 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 I meant another vehicle that we talked about that you're, uh, uh, you're, um, you're gonna be specking out next month. Yes, yeah. I am, um, getting a, uh, will be getting a Lamborghini Revuto. Mm. Is that how you pronounce that, Revuto? Yeah. Okay. I think so. But I'm sure some of the Italian followers of your channel. It's either that or Revuelto, I don't know. Revuelto or Revuto, I'm not sure. We're but probably we're, both wrong. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but that car um, is a hybrid. It's a um, little over a thousand horsepower. It's uh, electric and, and petrol, and um, it's um, the replacement for um, the Aventador. Yep. Beautiful car. Did, what's, the, uh, what's the price on those starting? Um, I think it's probably about five or 600,000. Yeah. Um, there will be, as all these cars now, the higher end, hard to get cars, there's always an aftermarket add-on by the dealership. Mm. You've got to be prepared to pay more than MSRP. If you're not, and some people aren't, and yeah. I, I, there was a time when I said absolutely not. That's the craziest thing in the world. I'm going to pay what you want, you know, what the manufacturer says it, it's worth. And you won't have the car. You won't have the car. Yeah. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Market, the market dictates what the value of that car is. Especially in a post-COVID world. Uh, it's... I don't want to say it's rare anymore because since we started uh, this show, it's more of a regular occurrence that we are meeting people that truly appreciate uh, these creations for what they are, which is, which is art. And one of the things that I missed when we talked about the Bentley outside is that uh, trim that comes down the center of the hood and basically splits the, the hood in half perfectly in alignment with the flying B, which is, I never even knew that they had a, uh, the B that, uh, you know, went up and down. Yep. Uh, like that. It's, it's, you just look at all of the lines and what it really takes to create some of these vehicles. I, it's a very, it's, it's insane. A, it's a beautiful car, very masculine car. Oh, yeah, it is, for sure. Um, uh, the haunches in the back, um, you know, the uh, rear exhaust pipes, it, it's, 
it's a it's a it's a man's car. It's a beautiful car. It's a beast. Love yeah. it. Well, Dean, um, I got to tell you, man, this has been a very very satisfying interview, and we are truly 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 looking forward to uh having you back on the show i'm really excited for you and for the project and um i i i'm looking at that logo back there and i'm just mesmerized by it I, i'm i'm really thinking that this is going to become a successful um piece of the automotive world right now um very very good job you've done Thank you very much, and much like you, nothing, nothing uh, we do is, is by ourselves. I'm just the forward-facing piece to this, uh, to this business. Uh, this is going to be a success because of the partnership and you know, that, that we're involved in to, to make this thing work. But we're very excited about it. We're glad to have you here, and I, I think I agree with you. I think it's a piece that's missing right now uh, in media today. Um, we're seeing a lot of car content, um, and we're seeing a lot of famous content but you know just the conversation we experience today uh, around me, the car is is missing i'm around a lot of people who have money yeah um you know i lived for a time down at the ritz in center city a lot of athletes uh were my neighbors mm -hmm. i won't name names um but having money yeah is a prerequisite to having uh really awesome motor vehicles yeah but it's not a guarantee that you're going to be specking or buying what I would think you should buy if you had all that money. In other words, some guys get, you know, um, an ugly Rolls Royce and wrap it in a horrible color um, and think that it's great. Um, I, I can spend 30,000 bucks on a car and have the greatest $30,000 car there is. Knowledge and taste. Yes. And those two things, when, you really, when you're really in this world, like you're truly, truly in it, you know, because you know the vehicle as much like people know art, you know what's going to appreciate. Yep. You know that the GT2 RS, the GT, uh, the Cayman GT4 RS, these are the last of their kinds, right? You know what colors sell typically better from a manufacturer than another manufacturer. You know better than to put 32 inch wheels <laughs> on, on your Bentley, uh, on your Flying Spur. So it's knowledge and, and it's taste, and it really is truly um, enjoying the art of it, not just getting something for show. Exactly. And, um, yeah, I mean, we could continue. You said $30,000, man, not, not to keep the conversation going, but Volkswagen, the reality is... Uh, um, oh, God. They made a car in the, in, in the 80s. Um... I don't know it. Uh, I, I have to turn to my phone, and I won't right now. But, but you can spend, my point is that you can spend um, small amounts of money, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. and have a really fun driving experience that will bring a smile to your face. My 30-some-odd thousand dollars, if I had to spend it right now, was going to an E34 M5, 1989 to 1995. Uh, BMW M5. I, I used to own that car. I I want one. Yeah. Bad, and I, I that's going to be something that that's a lifer. But listen, and that and that car was a lot of fun to drive. Yeah. It, and they're, you're saying they're going for be. they're going in the 30s now? Well, some of them. Obviously, there are examples that are going for ninety thousand dollars, you know, plus. But some of them on a like bringatrailer.com, right. you mm -hmm. know, with one hundred thirty thousand miles on it, one forty. They're going for for in the 30s, some in the 20s. Speaking of which, I think. In some regards, in some ways, BMW has lost their way. Uh, so with some their, enthusiasts say. With their current lineup. Yeah, and a lot I, of enthusiasts have been saying that. I, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll come back to being the driver's car that they always were. Hmm. Dean, um, we're going to wrap it up. It's been a pleasure to, to have you uh, on with us today. And I, I mean this. I don't say anything that I don't mean. I can't wait. <laughs> until we, we have you back. Um, this I'm was, looking forward to it. This and I'm was looking an, forward to watching your progression. Oh, it's going to be fun. Oh, I know. It's going to be fun. This was, this was an eye-opening learning experience, to say the least. And um, I think you're doing great work. I hope you continue to do it, and I hope you continue to reap the rewards, um, but also share your knowledge with others that are, are, are coming behind you. Thank you, Cleo. Thank it's you. It's been my pleasure really has and I'm looking forward to watching you grow 
and wheels and wealth grow. Thank you.